Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, interesting to see who's using containers because the times are changing, right? Our IT e ecosystem, the reality we're living in is changing from VMs, traditional deployments, more and more to Docker and integration of Kubernetes or other orchestrators. So as Blair just introduced me, um, I'm tackling this challenge at least part of my time. I'm trying to bring together Docker, Isinga2, and Kubernetes today. So let's see where it will get us. First, a few things about me. Once again, even more evidence that times are changing. That's my official headshot from when I joined NetWaste back in 2021. Um, I was an Isinga user before that since 2018, so roughly Isinga version 2.10, Isinga web 2.8. Those were the days where I was most active in the community forums as well as dbotkey without the underscore. Um, unfortunately, this activity has dwindled a lot. Um, mainly because I moved on to DevOps, Kubernetes, and the cloud in general in my day-to-day -day operations. So um, Isinga is not the main part of my job anymore. Um, that's one of the reasons I'm really happy to be here today, though, and bring it all together, trying to bring together containers, DevOps practices, Kubernetes, and deploying Isinga in a stable way. Um, Setting expectations, what's in this talk, what's outside of this talk. Um, let's start what I won't be telling you. Um, I won't give you instructions for production-ready Singer 2 and Kubernetes. Sorry, folks. That's just not in it right now. Um, we're not quite there yet. I will also not give a complete introduction to containers, Docker, or Kubernetes. However, I will provide a slight overview so the folks who are not working with those technologies yet might get some additional insights and motivation to start adapting those technologies. And of course, silver bullets don't exist, so I won't be giving you a silver bullet for Singer 2 in high availability mode either. What I will tell you, though, is um, a short discussion of the trade-offs of running Isinga 2 in high availability mode. Who of you is running Isinga 2 highly available? OK, that's roughly 50, 60 percent. Great. Um, I will then turn to my personal takes on Isinga 2 and its components in high availability mode. So those are hot takes, some of them, or at least a bit of a controversy. Um, I will give a short introduction to Isinga's official Docker images, because they do exist, and they are very well usable. Um, and I will finish it off, hopefully, with a working demo of a working example of Isinga 2 on Kubernetes. So let's see how that goes. First question, of course, in a talk about high availability, what is high availability? So the IEE defines it as the availability of resources in a computer system in the wake of component failures in the system. So that's um, a definition quite focused on hardware components, right? Which is bad for me because I'm, when I started IT, that was just the cloud, more or less. So good thing for me is this definition translates very well to software components in distributed architectures or just bigger software projects like Isinga. Um, so the next question then is, um, which components are there for Isinga 2? What, what makes up uh, Isinga stack in high availability? The short answer is quite a lot. So this is the average high available setup. Don't worry, you don't have to take all of that in at once. I'll break it up for you over the next few slides. We'll have two cores. Uh, two Isinga cores is, is what I mean with uh, the master servers. They do the scheduling, the management stuff, you know. Then there's Redis involved, Isinga DB, um, databases, and one of many Isinga web instances. So let's break it down a bit. Of course, there is our Isinga 2 core component. Um, in a high available setup, two of those talk to each other over API, negotiate who is in charge of scheduling, who is executing which check commands. Um, they communicate the current state to each other, right? Um, and several of Isinga 2's features are high availability aware as well, featuring things like automated failover, like Isinga DB, for example. Julian mentioned in his talk earlier, um, like a passive, active passive failover where one of the two sides is just watching the other one until it stops and takes over from there. So we have that behavior in quite some parts of Isinga 2. Um, and what Isinga 2 does in a, in a setup backed by Isinga DB as um, being in charge of our data is it writes its state to Redis, more or less. So in a high available setup, we, will have, we normally have two Redis instances, one per node. And each Isinga node writes its state to its, most of the times, local Redis instance. 
Um, the persistency in Redis is configured um, by snapshots. So if the state inside of Redis changes in a given interval, some keys or values changes, Redis takes snapshots itself, writes them to disk. That's how persistency is handled. Because we always have to keep in mind persistency can become cumbersome in high available setups, right? Um, another important thing to note is that those Redis instances are not clustered, so they don't talk to each other. They, they're just standalone instances. You could, for example, provide one cluster each per node, but that might be a bit overkill. Um, component three, then, is the SingRDB. It features uh, failover, so that's a nice thing to have. It's basically highly available out of the box. Um, each reads from its own Redis instance. That's where the no negotiation happens for failover as well. Um, and they both write to the same database, but because one is the passive part at every, at every time, um, it's only one daemon writing to the database at a time. So this component, gladly, is quite straightforward. Another one which unfortunately isn't quite um, straightforward, but rather the opposite is the database, because databases are hard, and databases in high available setups are even harder. We'll get to that on the next slide. First, what's in this database in a Singer setup? Most of you probably know, basically every component of your Singer 2 ecosystem writes or reads from or to the database in one way or the other. We have the history of checks and notifications and downtimes um, being written to the database by SingerDB. We got users and groups definitions being written to it by Singer Web if you're not using external um, authentication authorization like Active Directory, LDAP, whatever floats your boat. Um, we got configuration written to another database by the director if you use that for configuring your Yasinga environment. And then there's even more data coming in from modules uh, such as vSphereDB, reporting, X509, stuff like that. So the database is right at the heart of our whole Yasinga ecosystem. But is it high available or should we strive to get it high available? Well. That's a rocky road to go down because running databases in high availability mode is difficult because uh, technologies vary depending on the database vendor you go for. And there's just so many different ways of running a high available setup of um, databases. I'm not a database admin, so I'll give just a really short overview without going into details. You can have uh, a failover mechanism to a standby replica. You can have master-slave replications. You can have master-master replications. There are clustering solutions where you run, I call it proper clusters of databases using Galera for MariaDB, I think, or Petroni for PostgreSQL databases. Or you can go for uh, newer databases. I don't know if those work with Ysinga, though, so I'm just mentioning them for um, summarizing all the different types of getting databases high available which would be Cassandra or CockroachDB, um, which come to mind. So normally, when I go to clients and have kickoff workshops for their projects or stuff, um, I tell them, try to keep it simple if you don't really need it, if you don't need the extra 0.2% for your SLAs or something. Um, yeah, and the fifth component would be Singer Web, which is a PHP web application, which reads state from Redis and reads and writes from into the database as well. So this one should be easy to make highly available, right? It's just a web application. Just spin up another node, throw another Apache at it, configure a Singer web, and you're good to go. Well, yes, but also no, because the Singer writes local configuration. Um, for example, if your Singa web users tr um, decide to create their own dashboards, those are written to disk on the web server. Um, it uses sessions for authenticated users, which are um, held locally as well. And as we heard earlier, there are several Ysinga web modules which come with their own daemons, so those have to run as well, and those need to be made aware of high availability and stuff like that as well, because otherwise you might end up with duplicated state, for example, in vSphereDB when you have two daemons writing, uh, scraping vCenters and writing to the, data, to the database, right? So once again, just like with databases, in order to make this part of your stack highly available, you will probably have to integrate third-party tools like um, load balancers, things to sync the files which are written by Ysinga Web, and so on. Not, not the easiest thing to do. So summing it up, of course you can run Ysinga 2 in high availability mode. You can run all components of it in high availability mode, but there's a lots of moving parts within Ysinga's stack, even if you don't duplicate every single one of them. 
There's also lots of moving parts around a single stack once you decide to go down the HA route, like load balancers, virtual IPs, file sync. I just mentioned it on the last slide already. Um, and there's a lot of expertise you need to have or to get in very different areas if you want to do that. You will have to do advanced database administration. You will have to do advanced web server administration, maybe network administration, depending on your setup, and so on. More tools means more complexity. Also, there's always the risk of running in a split brain scenario, right? If things go wrong, um, maintainability gets worse because you integrate more and more tools in your stack. And with every tool you integrate, you will have to ask yourself the question, is this one adding up on the side of error proneness or of um, actually making my stack higher available in the long term? So once again, when we end up at a client's place for a kickoff workshop, one of the first questions I normally ask is, do you need highest availability or higher availability? Because at the end of the day, that's the question you should ask yourselves. And now we get to the hot takes path. So um, what if I tell you that we don't need 100% uptime for our Isinga nodes, especially not the masters? I mean, you can, you can outsource all the check execution to satellites, right? And use the masters for just managing the whole cluster, managing the scheduling, what goes where, collecting the states and the results. Does that have to be 100% available? Because at that point, it's just metrics. If it's down for one to five minutes, you miss out on one time data series. Um, following up on that question, what if our single two nodes on the master plane were stateless? Because that would allow us to just throw them away when they're failing and spin up a new node. Make that one the master in case of failure. That would also allow us to get rid of load balancers, service discovery, and file sync, because at the point where we are able to just recreate the state from the time where it was working fine, we don't have to rely on high availability anymore. If we react fast enough, we can throw away the failing node, spin up a new one, and get back to work with just one node and maybe 30 seconds downtime or so. That sounds like the perfect world for containers because they are throwaway things, as we will see on the next slide. They are ephemeral instances of an application which are based on so-called images. Um, an image, by definition, ships normally ships dependencies of your application, ships uh, default configuration of your application, and of course, the application itself. And the idea behind containers and container images is more or less built once, run almost anywhere. So you have one image which is distributable. You see this neat little image registry picture here on the right um, where you can publish your images. Um, other people can download the images, use them as is, or provide additional configuration. You can orchestrate them or run them in isolation. That's up to you. And normally they are operated by container runtime. You might have heard of Docker already. That's the nice little way with the containers on top right here. Um, or Podman, which is a bit newer project by Red Hat, going into the same direction with a slightly different approach. Um, but basically, that's all that is to it for containers to begin with. So the question is, does Isinga provide container images? And that's a very suggestive question because I told you earlier that they do. Yes. Um, how does that look like? So Isinga does not only provide images for Isinga core, but for every um, official component of Isinga too, so to say. So there are images for Isinga web, Isinga DB, even the director and other modules which come with their own daemons, so they need to be executed in a way or the other, because for those, you can just use the Isinga web image as well. Um, and Isinga chose to publish them on Docker Hub, which is one of those image registry. I would say it's still the, the most common one, but there are others which are catching up, like GitHub has its own, Google has its own, Red Hat has its own. Um, the thing is, they are publicly available. You can download them right now if you want to, and they contain fully functional Isinga components. Another nice thing about Docker Hub is it also provides us with all the other tooling we need for our Singer stack. We can get either a Postgres or a MySQL or MariaDB from there. We can get Redis from there. So our whole stack could be containerized if we want to and want to go the extra mile configuring it all initially. So the Isinga 2 image runs on basically any mainstream architecture. It runs on ARM. It runs on AMD64. It is configurable in a way so you can use it as a master, satellite, or even agent instance. So for example, instead of installing 
is singer to every of your agents. If they have Docker running, you can spin it up in a container if you do want to. It's mostly configurable via environment variables, which is always nice to have because you don't have to deal with um, persisted configuration. So for example, you can, you can pass uh, certificate authorities. You can tell it to ignore the local configuration, things you would normally pass to the Isinga node setup or node wizard um, CLI commandlet. And of course, as with most containers, additional configuration can always be mounted from the host system, so you are in fact able to pass um, custom configuration snippets, for example, should the need arise. The Singer Web 2 image is only being built for AMD64, but because it's just a PHP web application, it basically runs on ARM as well. I had no problems running it on my hardware so far. It's completely configurable with environment variables because uh, one of Singer's uh, developers wrote a nice little wrapper script which parses your environment variables and actually generates all the config which is needed on the fly. Um, again, additional configuration can be mounted. And as I told you earlier, all the modules with daemons can be run from inside the container, even though might, some might be nonsensical, but I'll get to this later. Um, yeah, that leaves us with Isinga DB, which is the newest part, newest component to Isinga as of today, um, which is maybe the reason why it doesn't run on ARM. It fails, it crashes silently, which was a bit of a bummer on my MacBook because I, I was debugging for four hours until I found the mistake. Um, so this one can only be run on AMD 64 today. Um, it's also completely configurable, and one of the few downsides due to its early stage of development, I, I guess, is um, that database migrations need to be done manually. So that's something you normally don't want to do with containers, having to do things manually, because that's where things tend to get icky. Um, gluing it all together, um, we now have containers for every part of our stack, so we can run our Isinga inside of containers if we decide to do so. Um, but we still have to configure each of them, and we don't want to do this manually. This is where we can rely on Docker Compose, which I just wanted to mention real quick. It's a plugin to Docker. It allows us to define and configure multi-container applications once in a YAML file and run them anywhere, so as, as long as you port the YAML file to another machine, you have Docker installed, you're good to go. And uh, Isinga's Eric Lippmann actually uh, built one of Docker Compose setup, which is available on GitHub, which works very well. I'd recommend to check this out if you're just getting started with containers because it's perfect for lab environments. I'm using it to run my small home setup, um, and it's, it's been running for quite some time by now without any problems, so good stuff right there. Anyways. Isn't there a better way? Docker is fine, containers are mighty fine, but um, they still have some shortcomings. So until now, in our procedure, in our transformation from a traditional setup to one which is simpler in terms of high availability but less reliant on all this duplication, we still deploy everything to just one node, to one host running Docker, running all our containers. What if our host goes down? We are still sitting there without a backup plan, um, without fast and easy recovery. There's no load balancing or traffic management should we decide to evolve this stack. Um, and data is also just getting persisted locally if, it, if it's getting persisted at all outside of the container. So that means once our host goes into failure mode, um, we will have a very hard time recovering data as well. So I was looking for better resilience. I was looking for a multi-node solution with what I call less locality, so data not being saved on one single node being able to fail over to a second node really fast. And this is where I went to a container orchestrator, which in my case was Kubernetes. There are others out there, um, but Kubernetes is becoming more and more mainstream. It's a container orchestration platform um, which connects multiple nodes to a cluster. Those nodes can be bare metal, can be VMs, can be cloud VMs, you decide. Um, and on those nodes, Kubernetes schedules and runs container workloads. What it also does is um, monitoring the health of those nodes and containers, so it will be able to tell in close to real time if either one of our nodes hosting the underlying infrastructure or one of our containers hosting or serving Isinga or Isinga Web 2 is in an unhealthy state and will react accordingly by um, redistributing the container to a healthy node, um, throwing away the unhealthy container and spinning it up again. Um, and all this happens, as I, as I said, in close to real time. Um, and another nice feature is uh, load balancing and traffic management 
up to a certain degree also storage management which comes with using Kubernetes as well. So quite a few neat things. Let's get started. Let's run a single tune Kubernetes. What do we need? We got our prerequisites. We got container images. We got a container orchestration platform. Fine. But who's Who's doing the heavy lifting now? Who's going to initially deploy and configure our Asynga 2 stack? Because, as I said earlier, quite a few moving parts, and it doesn't get easier in Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes uses declarative configuration, so a configuration in YAML files, which are referred to as Kubernetes manifests. And these can become quite complex, because um, in Kubernetes, you have huge se separation of concerns, many different API objects, which need to be um, defined and configured separately from each other. So we'll use a tool to help us here. The tool of my choice or our choice in NetWays was Helm, which rose to become Kubernetes unofficial package manager over the last few years. Um, it's basically a glorified templating engine with some concept of packaging stuff and additional metadata, um, which allows us to define our Kubernetes manifests, compile them, gather them, collect them, and compile them in a so-called chart which contains everything we need to spin up and deploy our application. Um, and the neat thing about charts is they can be shared in repositories with uh, quite the same feeling as using apt or yum or DNF these days. Um, also, charts can be configured at deploy and upgrade time with so-called values, which will then get uh, pasted into the templates when Helm deploys our application. And as you might have guessed already, some colleagues and I at NetWays decided to create an initial chart for Isinga 2. There will probably be more on their way because Isinga was so nice to provide um, us with a Helm charts repository on GitHub in their official organization. So we have one centralized spot or repository to place our charts in the future to publish them. And today, there's one chart. I'll be showing it in a few. Um, it's called Isinga Stack. And it does exactly that. It is able to deploy your whole average Isinga stack. It can deploy Isinga 2, Isinga DB, Isinga Web with all its modules and daemons, which are officially supported by Isinga. MariaDB, optionally, if you don't want to run your own database outside of the cluster or maybe inside of a cluster. And the same with Redis. Of course, you can also just deploy the subset of those components. And before I start rambling about the hand charts for another five minutes, let's just do a quick demo, shall we? Um, we start with an empty namespace in a Kubernetes cluster, which is actually running in, in a cloud. So you see I have two little nodes right here. Um, and I don't have any local Helm repo right now, so the workflow is quite, quite close to what you do with your normal package manager, where you have to get, for example, Isinga's repository, um, update your repos, and download or install the packages. So, I will now go ahead and do a Helm repo add. I will have to give the repository a name. I'll call this Isinga charts and point it right at our repository, which is hosted in GitHub pages. So it's just isinga.github.io and the repo name, which is Helm charts. Let's do a quick overview. Yes, nice, we got it. Let's update this one should be fine. Now we can go on with installing. I prepared a little demo repository here. So this looks wrong. I'm just noticing right now. So maybe, wait a minute. Looks better. OK. Um, in here, I got one of those values files. We'll look into that in just a second, where I configure my deployment. So let's just install the release. I give that one a name. I call it Isinga Camp Demo. I reference my repository, which I called Isinga Charts, and the chart I want to deploy, which is Isinga Stack. And I pass in the values. Helm takes it all, parses it, throws it at the Kubernetes API, and we're there, deployed. So while Kubernetes is now deploying all this stuff right here, which is all in a pending state right now because we need to get storage from the cloud provider and so on and so forth. Let's take a quick look at the values.yaml because that's where the magic happens. That's where we configure our deployment. It's a YAML file um, with 
different parts for all the components we want to deploy. So we have a single 2 in the top, we have a single DB, we have a single web 2. And we can deploy lots of things. So for example, I'm, I'm configuring an ingress here, which you can think of uh, like a reverse proxy entry in your day-to-day -day Nginx uh, web server. So I'm making the API of my single server available outside of the cluster. I'm passing a ticket salt, more on the clear text uh, problematics later on. Um, and I enable persistence, so if I shut down my cluster or kill the container or whatever, um, I can be sure that my data is in fact persisted across restarts, for example. Maybe it's a bit more interesting to look at a single web too because there's more to configure. I can pass the initial um, admin user. I can, um, with integration of other tooling for Kubernetes, create TLS certificates on the fly which will be valid in my case because I'm using um, ACME, Let's Encrypt, for certificate generation under the hood. Um, and I'm making my Single Web 2 service available on the web as well. There's also some global settings because as you know, there are many parts of Isinga which are used by um, different components, so they need to be global. Things like API users, which will need to be um, declared for both Isinga 2 to integrate into the API feature, but for example, in those cases for Isinga web and the director as well. So that's quite close to um, what was demonstrated in the previous talk. We'll also declare some databases, which we will use in our deployment, and we'll create a Redis as well in our cluster. So let's see, by now we should be good to go. Nice, everything's running. So the, the place to look up, to look to is our pods. So what are we running right now? We are running the AsyncDB daemon in its own container. We are running a Redis instance. We are running a single web 2 database, a single DB database, director database. Um, we are running a single 2 core, so the back end. And we got a single web 2 as well. If I now look at my, um, ingress definitions, which is like reverse proxy entries. I'm having this one host here, which is available on an external IP address. Perfect, that worked fine as well. If I go here, I end up on my Asynga Web 2 interface. That's neat. First part of the demo worked, nice. So let's log in. Working fine as well. And we see an empty interface. We also see that the daemon is running healthy. I guess you can't read anything, so let's make it a bit larger. That's fine? Okay. Um, we see the daemon is running. We also see that the daemon already um, kick-started our director uh, integration. This is a feature you can turn on or off in the Helm chart definition if you want to do that by yourself, for example. Um, I did it with the Helm chart now. So let's get started. Let's create some hosts, right, shall we? Um, I thought about because it's easy to do some web hosts and the hosts will get pinged. Let's create two hosts really fast. For example, isinga.com. This one will not work, funnily, funnily enough, because isinga.com is not pingable. Um, it will time out, but that's fine. Let's create another one just to have some entries in the front end. Google.com and now a simple HTTP service. Here we go with an apply rule. And we'll use it everywhere where host.name equals anything ending on com. Uh, ah, yeah, true. Let's do it like this. And if we deploy this, we'll see it's not slower than your traditional deployment. And we're done. If we go to the overview, we'll see Google is pending, Isinga is pending, we'll also see our services. And now, while, while the, those checks are getting their first results, let's get into the funny part. Um, one of my hot takes was I want parts of my deployment which I can just throw away upon failure, right? So let's try that. Um, let's see what components we have once more. 
and now for example get rid of our front end. I just deleted the single web 2 container and if I get the list of containers again we see almost by the second I deleted it it was recreated and it's up and running again. The only thing we need to do now is log in again because the sessions as I mentioned earlier are saved locally so those are gone by container restarting. Um if I log in again we'll see all the other configuration persisted though. Um So that's fine and by now we also got check results in the way we expect them to be. Google is up because it's pingable. The website is reachable. Isinga is reachable as well but Isinga is not pingable so that's fine for me. Let's try something else. Let's kill the Isinga DB daemon. Which is up here. Once again, already up again, creating the container and running. The web doesn't even report that it, it has been down. If we go to the health page, still running. Let's get a bit more reckless. Let's delete the director database and see what happens. Here it is being created again. Running again. And let's take a look. Host. Google.com looks good, still up and running with all the data we provided earlier. So basically fine. The ultimate test, let's get rid of Isinga, the backend, and see how that goes. Mm, where is it? You do there it is. In it, six seconds, eight seconds, ten seconds running. Back to the web front end. Health page still looking good. Isinga is still writing into the Redis. No downtime reported. We had an outage of ten seconds and it was fixed automatically. Let's try one last thing because I was talking about local locality of data. Um, if I go to this view, we see right now um, our Isinga 2 pod is running on this node here, or in fact, all our pods are running on this node. Um, let's cordon this node. In uh, Kubernetes uh, lingo, this means we're marking this node as unavailable. So new workloads will never end up on here. So if I cordon this node and now go on and delete, my um, pod, my, my Isinga backend pod, it won't be able to, to be scheduled on this node. Let's see if it got recreated on the other node though. Yeah, that's looking good. So we got automated failover from a possibly unhealthy node to another one as well. Great. So, what did we just see? We deployed a complete Isinga 2 stack um, with the Helm chart, so you, you just need to dive a bit into our, doc, into our documentation for once, um, create your values.yaml file, and you're ready to deploy all of this. The chart is highly and as soon as we get to writing documentation, <laughs> easily configurable, both on the application level, so you can, uh, you can configure how Isinga web will behave, how Isinga DB will behave. Um, all these kinds of stuff, but also on the Kubernetes level, um, so the underlying infrastructure. Failover is handled automatically with minimal downtime, and we also saw uh, the deployment um, integrating very well with other Kubernetes services like the ingress, uh, so that's the reverse proxying part, or the certificate creation for web access of Isinga Web 2. What did we not see? We didn't see many modules in Isinga Web. They are there, I can promise you that. I just uh, left them out for the demo to make it a bit less complex. Um, the hand chart also ships with same defaults so for, for most features in Isinga Web, uh, in Isinga, and most modules in Isinga Web. It will be enough to just set enable to, to, to true, and you're good to go. Um, except for some features and modules which we left out on purpose, because we think they are not a good fit for being run on Kubernetes. 
um, more on that in the documentation. Another thing we didn't see was me using custom check plugins because that's a bit tricky. They are not part of the Helm chart, so there's no way for you to reference check plugins in GitHub repositories or something and have them being included in the deployment. Um, you would have to build your own container images containing the checks, or you can mount them into the containers um, at deploy time in Kubernetes. Support for that is in the Helm chart already as of today. Um, and the most interesting part is the next steps, of course, because this project is at today in a 0 0.1 release version. We plan on providing a 0 0.11 or even 0 0.2 in a few weeks. Um, it's still highly alpha-ish, so please don't use it in production. Um, and for the next releases, we strive for more configuration as code um, throughout all of uh, the stack. For example, um, we want to be in, in an ideal scenario, you want to be able to define business processes right in our values YAML file. Um, so you have one centralized part where all your configuration lives and breathes. And we want to integrate uh, pre-existing secrets. So imagine your database admins provide databases for you outside of your cluster. And this way, they will be able to um, more or less push the secrets to Kubernetes and uh, Helm fetches them instead of you having to declare them in clear text in your values YAML file. And as mentioned a few times already, we are still lacking on the documentation part. We really need to get up to speed there. And some examples won't hurt either because um, not everybody is there yet with containers in Kubernetes. So I imagine having a few examples will make the entry a bit easier. Takeaways and final thoughts, because I think I'm quite on time. Um, Monitoring with Isinga 2 does not always have to provide highest availability. Um, sometimes it's just enough to react fast, react quick, and react seamlessly. That means nobody should notice that you were down. I think I just demonstrated this. We had minimal downtime. No human had to be called at 3 AM. Kubernetes did all the heavy lifting for us. Um, Isinga 2 can definitely be running containers and Kubernetes. Um, containers are a bit more mature than the Kubernetes part I just um, demoed, but we'll get there, I think. And depending on your use case, this can be a very viable option for at least parts of your monitoring infrastructure. You can get started with the Compose project or the Helm chart. And uh, yeah, please try it out. Give feedback, contribute, open issues. Um, thank you very much. And the slides are available online. Um, you can look them up. If you can't remember the whole link, go to slides.debotki.me. It's an empty HTML page with two links. You'll find your way. Thank you very much. So thank you, Daniel, first of all. Um, I think we have some minutes left, which we could take for any open questions for Daniel over there. Yeah, hi, thanks. That was brief and uh, dense. Just out of curiosity, uh, the cluster you were using in the demo, how, how is uh, I seeing a DB and director, how are they persisting data in, in this specific example? It's, it's very hard to understand. Uh, Blair, can you report the, uh, repeat the question maybe? Or, maybe if you or repeat it a uh, bit louder, please? How, how does the I seeing a DB store data in your cluster? How does the single DB store data where? Sorry. In the, like, you have the cluster, right? Yes. The, uh, Kubernetes cluster. What's the storage component? Uh, I'm running this in a public cloud provider. So um, the, the Kubernetes component called uh, cloud something something manager, I always forget about it, just to provide storage for me. And I'm using the, the um, default uh, container storage interface, um, which comes with the cluster. So I don't actually know. That's one of the design questions you've had, you'd, you'd have to solve um, if you're, for example, running uh, on-prem. But for most cloud providers, there's a viable option to integrate um, persistent storage to your cluster if it's not done by default, and that would be the way to go. So um, basically, um, upon creation of this deployment, the cluster notices um, that I requested storage, and it will provide storage which is easily um, mountable for any of the pods, but only one at a time. This is like the default model. Um, so no matter where I shift my single DB container, it will always end up with the same storage mounted in, in again. Um, and how that is done exactly is different from cloud provider to cloud provider, or Kubernetes cluster to Kubernetes cluster. Does that answer the question? 
more or less, okay. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, uh, you mentioned that the single agent is also possible to be deployed. Is it a daemon set for the Kubernetes nodes, or why would I have a single container with an single agent in the cluster? Um, I think. Okay, let's let's start a bit earlier. So I mentioned that Isinga 2 as a container is um, deployable as an agent. That's true. I really like the idea of a daemon set for Isinga agents um, being rolled out to every member of of your cluster, every node. And we don't have that in the Helm chart yet, but I'll add it as a feature request because that's a great idea. Yeah, thanks. All right, final question. Um, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, does Helm replace uh, infrastructure as a code like Terraform um, if I want to only build uh, yeah, a singer in it? Uh, I don't think so because Terraform deploys infrastructure and Helm deploys workloads. Um, it, it always depends because um, Kubernetes is basically a building kit for, for building platforms. And depending on how you build out your cluster, you would be able to deploy infrastructure with Helm as well. But that's not the common use case. So I think those two technologies um, will still coexist. OK, thank you very much. OK, um, thank you, Daniel. <laughs>